Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Justin Leopard, your online cello teacher, and today I want to talk about how to play double stops. So a double stop is basically where you play two notes at the same time, one on adjacent strings, and because it's stopping on those two notes together as opposed to moving on those two notes together, it's called a double stop. So a double stop is kind of like a chord, but on cello and it's only two notes. There's like triple stops too, where you roll the chord a little bit, but we're gonna talk about double stops. So double stops can come in any interval that your hand can physically reach. So it'll be as small as a minor second, and it'll be as wide as whatever your, whatever your hand can reach. And today I wanna to talk about the most common ones, so we're gonna talk about thirds, sixths, fourths, fifths, and octaves. And I know that sounds like a lot, but a lot of them group together. So the other thing is, you know, this is all difficult. So this video should not be, you know, you suddenly know how to play double stops, but hopefully you know how to approach them in your own practice. A really great book to get if you also wanna see the notation for a lot of these concepts we're talking about is Mark Yampolsky's scale book method, where he goes through all sorts of different variations in every key. And if you're really systematic about it, you can take you know, the variation he uses for E flat and then also apply it to D and you know, really be able to cover a, a lot of your bases there. But let's start by talking about the open, but let's start by talking about the perfect intervals, so-called because they don't have a difference between major and minor, they are just there. So the perfect intervals are fourth, fifth and octave. You could also count unison as a, as a perfect interval if a unison is an interval. Unison would be where you play two notes that are the same. So the open D string and then that D, if you, that's like a unison double stop. So it's kind of hard to do that on other notes because you have to do some sort of weird fingering pattern and it's just not really necessary. But you will have to use fourths and fifths and they're both pretty tricky because you just have to get them in tune. So with a fourth, you're always gonna have a pattern no matter where you are in the cello of something that's over one string and then down a whole step from where the note is on the bottom string. So you'll either have, you know, three and one, extended two and one, four and two, and that's pretty much it. So you have those fingerings that you're gonna have for fourths. And the tricky thing about tuning fourths is that um, if they're a little bit off, they sound wrong and sometimes the note will be in tune to one of the open strings or in tune to what you thought sounded correct but it's not in tune to the other note of the double stop and this is really going to be a key feature of the double stops throughout all of them but fourths are really notorious if you're a little out of tune it's it's really bad and the reason why it's really bad is because if it's a little flat like a little bit uh, too narrow of an interval, it's gonna sound like maybe you tried to hit a major third horribly. Like instead of you hit, you know, you sounded close to something that was right. On the other on the other side, it's even worse because if you go up a little bit, it sounds like you got an out of tune tritone. A tritone could sound in tune, you know, even though it's a dissonant interval. But if you're like, that is very, very nasty. Um, pretty much not used in music. Uh, quarter tones are, but that specific sort of like interval is pretty grating because it sounds so close to something that we think uh, should be in tune and then it's not. So the way that we do tune it is we just pay attention to what the resonance of the instrument is. So this is a really a common theme. So luckily, as far as the what we were just doing, the D and G, we can tune to the open string. So we can tune the D and then we have to try to just remember where that finger was so you can play open G string and play the one. Hooray! And this is, of course, assuming that your strings are already in tune. But if you're unsure, if you hit the note and it, and it sounds bad, how do you get it in tune? Well, the way that you get it in tune is you move it and you pay attention to what happens. So if you hit and you're not sure what happens, well, let's start by going a little bit sharper. And now we're starting to lay a tritone, so that wasn't right. Let's go flat. Okay, and we started to get that. So what you're gonna wanna be able to do is practice finding it and then also going 
right to it. And one trick you can use is that if you really have it in your ear, what's supposed to happen, if you hit it a little out of tune and slide into it, you know, as long as you were close to the note in the first place and as long as you get there very quickly, it really doesn't sound like you played out of tune. It just sounds like you did something musical into the note. So fifths are similarly tricky and they're tricky because even though you can bar your fingers, again, our strings are in fifths, so we're just barring in order to make a fifth. You know, if you just put your fingers down, well, I guess at this point I've kind of learned how to uh, adapt for that, but uh, your fingers, if they're at the wrong angle, are going to make the fifth out of tune. Okay, let's, let's get an out of tune fifth. Okay, that's, that's out of tune. So we got, we got an E that's real flat to the A string. And we have basically a quarter tone flat A. All right. So that's not very in tune. If we want to, you know, assuming that we're trying to hit the A and E, got to bring that A up. So let's tune that A. All right, those are in tune to each other. And this is another example. Fourths are actually inverted fifths. So we have A on either side, but if we play just the, the one on the D string and the A string, that's a fourth. And then down here, that's a fifth, but they are otherwise the same notes. So this is something interesting about all the intervals actually. Seconds are opposite sevenths and same thing with thirds and sixths. So speaking of thirds and sixths, let's talk about those because with thirds and sixths, we often can do something that we rarely or just don't or can't do uh, with the fourths and fifths. Now, another reason you wouldn't do this with fourths and fifths, which is to make a scale with it, is because in classical music, there's been sort of a prohibition on what's called parallel fourth and fifth motion. The reason being, you know, because obviously like you, you can, like <laughs> there's a lot of options in music, but if you have like three or four part voices, or even if you have two, if you have something that moves in fifths, it suddenly sounds like you lost a voice. It doesn't sound harmonized anymore. So if you're going like... Those last few notes did not quite sound so... Well, like the first few notes, they really sounded like counterpoint. And then you end up with these kind of, oh, unusual harmonies that happen as a result. So anyways, fourths and fifths are usually avoided as scales, but the same is not true of thirds and sixths. Although this doesn't make them any easier because they're hard to tune for the same reasons why anything else is hard to tune, which is intonation itself is a bit of an imperfect concept. So we're gonna go a lot deeper into this in into a video on intonation. However, in brief, intonation is when frequencies line up well. You know, they, they occur at a regular interval and they line up with each other at a certain ratio. This gets very complicated very quickly when you involve a lot of different notes because things just don't always line up that way, especially when you're switching keys. And it basically took um, music, you know, hundreds of years to decide on the equal temperament that has basically been at the core of modern pianos and ultimately, you know, pop music and everything else because we're used to hearing it that equal temperament system on the piano makes every note equally out of tune as much as it makes every note equally in tune. So you, you do have imperfect layering of frequencies with an in tune piano. Now on cello, you have the opportunity to actually adapt to that, but you also have to be considerate of things like open strings. So if you're playing this third, for example, the B on the G string and then the open D string, you're kind of at the mercy of the open D string. You have to tune to the open D string. Now, is this B that's in tune to the D string? Is that in tune to G? It's, it's actually a little flat. And then if we play that with the D, we would have wanted to make that D a little bit sharper in order to make it work out. So this means that if we're playing, we're having to make some compromises along the way because that B and D aren't gonna to wanna to fit together. So one of the compromises we could make is to basically do what equal temperament does. You know, the G and the D are in theory already in tune to each other. So if we make that B equally in tune to both of them, that could be one solution. So we have. Of course, that doesn't sound 
as nice. A nicer solution is to really listen to the bottom note for the most part, and then if you are using open strings, which you can also elect not to do, like this, this double stop can be played here like this, and then you don't have this issue. But if you are, then you have to be sensitive to making sure that at least the third that included the open string was in tune to the open string. Thirds are really devilishly tricky, and there's a fingering where you can, in one position, do two thirds with thumb position that you can discover in the Mark Polsky book, and I don't think is exactly the point of this video because we're going over all of the different possible double stops, but it remember what I said, thirds are mirrored of sixths, and sixths are a little bit easier. Now, with both thirds and sixths, one thing you have to deal with is that they're not perfect intervals. They are either major or minor. So you really have to remember what those patterns are. So with the, with the whole scale, you know, it's uh, with the major scale, I mean, it's gonna be whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half. And what that means for you is that uh, you're playing a major third, which means your hands, fingers are close together, then two minors where your fingers are further from each other, two majors where your fingers are closer to each other, two minors where your fingers are further away from each other, and then a major, or there. So that's a pattern you have to memorize. And it gets even more complicated if you want to involve harmonic minor, because remember how harmonic minor, or melodic minor really mixes up all the notes. You know, melodic minor goes up, only one note's different from major, but then it comes back down differently. So G, harmonic, melodic minor is. Then that means that if we're playing the minor scale, okay, that was a little bit of a poor demonstration. I really just want to focus on those top few notes. So when you're going up the scale, you're going to go. But then on the way down, you have to go. And it's a little bit complicated to just remember what those patterns are. So it, it, it matters to practice actually doing it and getting it kind of in your ear. I think once you've actually done it enough with your fingers and you think about it a lot, then you can start breaking on through to the other side of being able to intuitively control this stuff. So sixths are similarly, they're either major or minor. A major sixth is going to be kind of the opposite of a fourth in that it's over one string and up a whole step. So that's a major sixth. Sometimes you'll use two and four. And a minor sixth is one and two or three and four, maybe two and three, could be. Um, and when you play a scale, it's gonna be the opposite of what it was for the thirds in that Remember how thirds went major, minor, minor, major, major, minor, minor, major? Well, the sixths are going to go basically the opposite. You're gonna start with a minor sixths and then do two majors and then two minors, two majors and a minor. So if you do G with sixths, we're gonna start with our G here with second finger, we can play the third B there. Remember, these are the, just the same notes flipped up because we have G here and we have B. So instead of a third, and a major third, it's a sixth and a minor sixth at that. So one thing that we can do when we're playing the sixth though, is we can usually do two per uh, position quite easily. So we can do. Okay. So at this point in the video, I want to pause a little bit on talking about what the notes are and teach you guys a little bit more about how to play double stops. And when we talk about how to play double stops, we're not just talking about shedding the actual fingers. We wanna make sure that we're having a good sound. So the difference between playing one note and a double stop is that you have less options for what the angle of your bow is for a double stop. When you're playing just one note, you can rock the bow quite a bit without hitting the notes. I'm not hitting the neighboring strings, but I'm moving the bow. Now, if I'm playing a double stop, however, you can still, uh, control it and you should because you can you can make one string a little louder than the other that's actually a good thing but you have just less room to move before you're just not playing that note so I was doing basically as much motion as with the single string but I was losing the note just a little bit so you have just a little less motion you know 
know, you're just a little bit more restricted in that way. Similarly, you have to get the strings to actually want to work together. And while there's a theoretical component to this where you want the, you know, the vibrations, the frequency, if you pictured the waveforms to in some way line up with each other, there's also a physical reality of the cello itself. So if you're, if you're playing this note, you know, and that's going pretty wide, that's going wider than its fair share uh, if the A string is also to be resonating. Now luckily the A string doesn't resonate as much. Why am I playing these notes so strongly? Well, because I want to make sure that I'm testing my limits. Those, you, we don't want those strong strings to hit each other. And they're probably not going to on the D and A string, but they could on the lower strings. So what we want to make sure to do is try to find warmth somehow in the way that these two strings vibrate together. And the ways that we do that include phrasing, good bow contact point, which means where you're hitting it between the fingerboard and the bridge. It means finding um, that more of that relaxed hand motion with your hand. So you don't have to overthink the fifth. You can do the same thing that we do with any other note where you're in the string and you pull it. And it doesn't have to be perfectly you know, even, but it's good to practice that. something that has a little bit more interest so you can do that by rocking back and forth the strings a little bit digging in versus not choosing which note you want to emphasize of the two then when you're playing your actual double stop scales you use the same ideas but it's just gonna go by faster <laughs> infinite ways that you can work on making it better or worse. The final thing I want to talk about are the hardest ones, so don't really worry about doing this yet, but it's um, something that comes up a lot in the cello solo repertoire, which are octaves. So octaves are where you play the same note up an octave and you use either an extended fourth or thumb position in order to be able to play it. And these are notoriously tricky because like unison, it has and fourths and fifths, it has to be perfectly in tune. And also, you know, every single position you're in, when you think about it, is a slightly different hand shape because up here, the notes are really close together compared to down here. So you're always changing the width of your fingers and you really have to listen. So octaves are useful for that, at least. In any double stop that you're doing, you want to try to actually hear both lines. So like in what I just played, but also what was going on on the D string. When both of those, you can hear them together. I can't play both of them that fast. Okay. <laughs> All right, I guess I gotta practice that going at least a little bit faster. But you have to listen to both of them though. So when you're playing octaves, it's the same way. Just try to really focus on, you know. you'll start to find it. You know, it's the same rules as anything else. You want to be able to listen in your mind to audiate what you want to be able to hear and then practice to that ultimately. So this includes listening to a lot of music and practicing scales and double stops and things so that they're there for you when you want them to be. Um, even if you have to practice, you know, specifically using them in that moment because <laughs> to learn all of them is a lot, okay? But hopefully this video was a good introduction for how to play double stops, to practice the different notes, to know which ones do have differences. You know, fourths and fifths are the same, but thirds and sixths are different. You know, they're major or minor. To think about how to play two strings at the same time with a good sound. And finally, how to hear double stops as being two different musical lines played at the same time. Especially when you start to mix thirds and sixths and fourths and octaves, it can get pretty fun to play different things on the cello that are multiphonic in that way. 
Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Really appreciate it as we appreciate you watching all our videos. Hopefully you're getting a lot out of it. Let us know in the comments how things are going. Once more, my name is Justin Leppard, also known as the Vagabond Cellist, and this is Higher Hertz. So subscribe for more cello lesson videos, and we'll see you in the next one.